So, I also want to talk about the uh, anti-cavitation valves. So again, here they show a check valve symbol. And that is in this work port line, which is going to the rod end of the list cylinders. And there's our anti-cavitation check valve. Um, so that would be in this work port, going to the rod end for the lift function. And there's our anti-cavitation check valve. So what that looks like, um, that valve, another one here, it's basically just a flat disc. Let's see if I can get some better light on that. It's just a uh, flat disc and there is a spring in there and I like to hold up there if I get a uh, right angle pick I can actually show how this valve opens usually and there it is in the open position so I'm pushing it open but you could uh, argue that it's actually a vacuum pulling on that surface of the disc. If you get a vacuum in the work port, it's going to pull that open, draw that open off its seat, and pull oil in from the tank. So oil from the tank is going to come backwards through this valve and get drawn into the cylinder that's got a negative pressure or a void or a vacuum. Now, because of the cooler and the filter, there isn't zero PSI on the outlet of the valve, there might be 100 PSI. So again, you can kind of argue that in your own mind. Would 100 PSI back pressure be pushing the oil in, or would a negative pressure or a vacuum be pulling the oil in? Uh, generally, when we talk about an anti-cavitation valve, they talk about it being pulled in, but you got to remember there is back pressure on this valve's outlet. So, what's going to happen again is, if a port relief is opening on the head end, letting oil out of the head end of the cylinder, well then the cylinder is going to be collapsing or retracting by some external force pushing on it. Well that means that the rod is retracting into the cylinder. We're going to need oil in the rod end and, and the spool is in the hold position so it can't come from the pump. So that's where the anti-cavitation valve is going to let that oil in to make up the void. And again in reality oil blowing out over this port relief is just going to go into the return passage, cycle around the valve, come back in here, come through these holes, and come into the rod end. So that's a port relief, that's an anti-cav. And again, that just reflects what they've showed on the schematic. Port relief here on the head end work port line, going to the cylinders, and then on the rod end line, we've got an anti-cavitation valve. On this particular model of Bobcat, they also show a port relief in one port of the tilt function. And then they show a combination port relief and anti-cav in the other. I don't know why they don't have combination port relief and anti-cavs in both, but they don't. Um, so truth be told, what I've been just describing as a, a port relief here, I don't really have the ex exact right valve that belongs in the lift function. This is actually one for a tilt function that has a port relief and anti-cav together. So this is a combination port relief and anti-cav and I'll just show you how that works again. There's normally a cap on here. The cap's gone and I'm actually taking the adjuster out. If you were taking one of these apart to inspect or clean it, you'd want to count how many turns you took that you turn to take that uh, adjuster out of there. So when you put it back together you'd be pretty close to its setting and you don't have to do some fine adjustment to reset it. So at first glance, inside this basically looks like a direct acting relief valve. It's got a poppet and a single spring. Um, and pressure would push on the nose of this and push it open against the heavy spring and let oil out the radial holes. But the trick to this is in the poppet, they've actually built in a little anti-cavitation check valve. So in there, there's also an anti-cav. That's sort of a miniature version of uh, of this anti-cav, I'm not sure, you know, what how how effective it would be compared to how much oil this can let be drawn into a cylinder. But it's you know some sort of a compromise. But it's basically built that anti-cavitation check valve poppet into the poppet of the direct acting relief. So in a pressure spike application, this whole poppet's going to move out of the way. In a vacuum condition or 
cavitation condition, it's going to pull it off its seat that way and allow oil to come in backwards from the tank. So that is a combination port relief and anti-cav that they built into one valve. They needed to do that because you've only got one installation location for each work port. So if you need a port relief and an anti-cav for each port, well then you've got to build them into the same cartridge. The other the other uh, way that Bobcat could have addressed that would be to simply use a pilot-operated port relief. Pilot-operated cartridge relief valves are automatically, for the most part, anti-cavitation valves as well. The unloading valve cup will act as an anti-cavitation check valve. And I don't know how I'm adjusting this. I'm just cranking that back in. But I would, this would have to be adjusted when it went back together and the cap would go back on. So again, our schematic is showing one of those. Uh, in this location, this valve with the yellow box around it, is this guy, our combination port relief and anti-cap. And then they just show a regular port relief, the same one as here, and then they show another port, port relief that would install for the uh, auxiliaries. So we could have a total of well, one port relief here, an anti-cav here, then we might have a combination port relief and anti-cav on either side or both sides, or a combination of one port relief and one combination valve, and then here another port relief. And again, those port reliefs set a couple hundred PSI higher than the main. So what else is left to talk about? Let's look at the actuation of the auxiliary valve. So lift and tilt. You can see the uh, linkage holes here. So that lets you know those are mechanically operated valves. However, if you've got a Bobcat machine that has the optional uh, advanced hand controls or selectable joystick controls, instead of mechanical linkage, you may find your machine has electric actuators. So you might see some components that look kind of like this. This one's a part for, I'll show you what's inside it in a sec here. But if you've got advanced hand controls or selectable joysticks on this generation of machine, then there's a manifold that goes on here, um, a mounting platform basically for these actuators. These are bi-directional DC motors. I've taken these wires out of the connector um, and they basically run a bi-directional motor in here one way or the other when it turns through a belt in there it drives the actuator in or out so that way i'm extending you can see the boot kind of lengthening and it's turning a worm gear in here if i turn the other way you can see the boot kind of retracting so i've got electric actuation now of the spool direct electric and uh, with that, they get rid of just the pedal linkage, and then you've got uh, position sensors in your hand and foot controls, and a computer's involved in between processing the inputs and operating this motor to output and wind the spools to four positions if it's on the lift. So lift, tilt, auxiliary, or lift, tilt, uh, sorry, lift, lower, hold, and float, or uh, you know, rack back, dump, and hold if it's the tilt function. And then this is a position sensor that also is driven off of the belt. And of course, if you take these apart, you're going to mess up the calibration. But in here, there's a position sensor, and there's three wires also that go into the harness for a total of five, two for the motor, three for the position sensor. And they tell the computer where in the linear motion that spool actually is. So there's a calibration involved with that as well. So a lot of bells and whistles on top of mechanical linkage but that allows the machine to have optional hand or foot control of the implements for lift and tilt. For auxiliary, whether you've got a base machine or you've got a machine with some options, um, they're never mechanically operated. The auxiliary is always electro-hydraulically operated. So these valves that we saw on the schematic, uh, this guy and this guy, these two small DCVs with the solenoids on the end, 
well that's here so there's the solenoid coil um, coil of wire it's going to make an electromagnet and there's this little spool inside this miniature cartridge dcv that can be manipulated with magnetism and that's going to then let pressure into the end of the auxiliary spool and hydraulically shift it and then the one over here proportions pressure into this end of the spool and